So we're, today we're going to be talking about visioneering first. And, um, you know, it's, you put vision together with engineering, visioneering, there you go. <laughs> but you can go in your Bibles over to Nehemiah. And yesterday we, we started out with the, the core principles of, of leadership in Christ. First and foremost, it's faith. Before you do anything else, we need to be faithful before God. The second was, you know, talking to small group leaders, and we need to empower our small group leaders with faith and about the resurrection of Jesus from Lake Hay. Um, today, you know, when we talk about going into a COVID semester as campus ministers, what are we doing? What, what should we do? Hey, what are you guys doing? You know, people have asked us that. And, and honestly, I've said, you know what, I'm still trying to figure it out. And I'm actually really looking forward to the next two hours as we interact to figure out things together. But what I do know is that we're, we're, uh, we're married to the mission. The mission never changes, but the methods, we're just dating. We, we date the methods. We might date a different method or during COVID than we do regularly, but the mission never changes. And so what Toy and I are going to do, we're going to talk about two principles of leadership, and then we're going to have an extended time of a guided discussion. And then Tom McGurk's going to talk about two more principles of leadership, and then we're going to do some cohorts and some ministry toolbox. So Toy and I are starting with vision and intention. You know, visioneering is, is vision combined with engineering, but, it, you know, some of you guys are engineers that might not connect. For me, for leaders, you don't need to be an engineer, but you do need to be intentional with your leadership. So we're going to talk about these two for about 10 to 15 minutes, and then we'll have a guided discussion. So let's start with vision. We're going to start in Nehemiah chapter 2, and, um, and we kind of read around Nehemiah 1 and 2 and 3 yesterday. We're going to bounce around a little bit. But Nehemiah 2, what was Nehemiah's vision? You know, in the, in the month, in verse 1, in the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, and I can't see that part of my screen, but something, oh, the wine was brought for him. I took the wine and gave it to the king, and uh, I'd never been sad in, the presence, in his presence before. So the king asked me, why does your face look so sad when you are not ill? This can be nothing but sadness of heart. I was very much afraid, but I said to the king, may the king live forever. Why should my face not look sad when the city where my ancestors are buried lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire? The king said to me, what is it you want? Then I prayed to the God of heaven and I answered the king. It, if it pleases the king and if your servant has favor in his sight, let him send me to the city in Judah where my ancestors are buried so I can rebuild it. When we talk about vision and we're looking at Nehemiah during CTP, gathering and rebuilding, Nehemiah had a very clear vision. His vision was to rebuild the city of Jerusalem. And the king asked him a question. He said, what is it you want? And I think it's a good question for all of us to really evaluate is what is it you want in your ministry? You know, Nehemiah 2 and verse 12, it wasn't just something that Nehemiah personally wanted for his ministry, but it was something that God had put on his heart. Nehemiah 2, 12, he says, what my God had put in my heart to do for Jerusalem. And then when he's before King Artaxerxes, he, the king asked him a question, what is it you want? And he knew exactly what it was. But for us, of course, Artaxerxes is in our king, but we do serve a king, Jesus. And it reminds me of, of Mark 10, that Jesus asked the blind uh, Bartimaeus the same question, what do you want me to do for you? And I think this is something when we talk about vision, we have to have, know exactly what our vision is that God has put on our heart. It's not just something man-made, it's something that God has put on our heart. And I think this is in so incredible. And before we continue, I do want to pause on this because when we are talking about vision, one of the biggest killers of vision is when we go off of our own man-made vision instead of God's vision. Because ultimately, our dreams and our visions flow out of our walk with God and out of our prayer life of God. All of Nehemiah 1 is a prayer. He prays before he answers the king. It flows out of that. And I actually wanted to bring up a comment I made yesterday because I think I unintentionally emphasized something. And, um, you know, yesterday, one of my weaknesses as a leader is that when I'm in front of a crowd or when I'm on Zoom, I can try to go over the top to help the engagement, to help the excitement. And when I was lifting up Cody, you know, I, I said a comment. I said, 
uh, you know, Cody leads the, the largest single campus ministry in our nation at Kennesaw State. And I honestly, as soon as I walked off, I, I thought the spirit kind of hit me. And why would you have to say that? It, it is. We want to be inspired by what God is doing, you know, on campuses all around the world. Man, we want to be inspired how God has helped, a, you know, there to be 100 students in the KSU campus ministry. That's incredible. But why did, why did I feel like I had to say the largest? What, was I trying to lift up like Cody in a certain way or North River in a certain way? Was I trying to put across a man-made thing that we uplift instead of really lifting up what God is doing. And honestly, I, I kind of, God like sat on my heart about that last night. I called two brothers this morning to talk to them about it. Um, but man, I, I want to really make sure to put the emphasis as a leader on what is God leading us to do. And I just want to, in humility, say, man, we're all trying to figure this out. And um, I'm inspired by what's happening around the world. I mean, I've heard in, in, out in Nigeria, you've got 350 students in y'all's campus ministry. I mean, that's so inspiring. Um, but as leaders, uh, when people ask, man, how's North River grown so much? Like, what have you seen? What's God do for you? I know when I look at my life, it's actually, I see a continued series of my failures and sins and arrogance. And then I see God's power and grace and mercy. And then it's God that overflows and it's God that powerfully has moved in all of our ministries. As we go into the leadership principles of vision and being intentional and strategically thinking through our ministry, let us never think that it depends more on us than it does on God. Yes, we're going to work because God, and we're going to work hard because God depends on us and he's chosen us and we need to be confident in that. But I never want my arrogance to make it look or in, for, in my heart to, for me to think that it depends more on me than on God. So first and foremost, we need to go to Jesus and see what he's put on our heart because when we go after a man-made vision, it will ultimately always fail. But when we go after the vision of God and what he gives us with walking with him, it will last forever. So, um, but if we go back to, to vision, because we're talking about intention and vision, you need both. And whether you have it inside of you or you have a teammate and one of you is better at vision and one of, at having vision and one of you is better at being intentional, you got to have both because intention without vision produces aimless, busybody leaders and non-committed followers. Intention without vision produces aimless, busybody leaders and non-committed followers. You see, when, when you are intentional with the work, when you, make, when you teach, when you fill up and you live with an example of you're intentional and in getting with your leaders and, and having meetings and sharing your faith and filling your schedule with Bible studies, and you teach that to your leaders. And you teach them how to be intentional and how to make sure to have that talk and negotiate their faith here to make sure the Bible talk is awesome. If they don't know why they're doing it, if they are intentional and they're working hard, but they don't know what, how it plays into the greater vision, into the greater dream, then yes, they might be busybody, but they're aimless. And suddenly they might be having appointments that should help your overall direction of your ministry. But if they don't know how it fits into the bigger vision, they become aimless and it doesn't help. And then your followers that see your schedule, they can start to be uncommitted because then they go, wait, why are you so busy? where are you going? And if I don't know where you're going, and, but you're calling me to be busy and I don't know why, then why would I ever commit to that? Intention without vision produces aimless, busybody leaders and non-committed followers. Toya is going to come and talk more about that. Hey, good morning. Um, it's good to be together. It's weird using a mic. Um, I love this topic of vision and dreaming. Um, I think with Nehemiah's example, dreaming for the semester, it's going to be so important this semester because we're kind of like in a position to see something that doesn't look good. And with our faith and with our vision, with our dreaming, obviously we're going to add intentionality onto that. But with our vision, we can create something amazing, like a layout or a floor plan that you kind of just start with the bare bones. And then with what you can faithfully imagine, you can create something amazing. And I thought about like Joanna Gaines, how she can like walk into a house that is like busted and be like, yes, we're going to add some shiplap and like <laughs> all this stuff that she does. And she can just envision it. And, and more, even more than Joanna Gaines, I think about Jesus. Jesus looks at mankind 
and is like, yeah, I see this, I see that, not necessarily, you know, the best of the best, but this is what they can be. I think we really have to have vision to see the before and after of what a COVID-19 semester could be like with faith. You know, what I love about Nehemiah is that he owned his role in the vision. You notice he said to the king, send me, like I want to go and, and rebuild the wall. And that's kind of a hear my send me attitude, right? Like where he wasn't doubting himself. He wasn't feeling like, well, why me? Well, this is so hard. I don't think I have what it, ha what it takes to, to help in this, in this realm. But Nehemiah was like, no, God put this on my heart. God put me here. I must be the person for the job. And I'm faithful that God has good works for each of us to do in our ministries this semester. And Obviously, we, we love seeing people come to Christ. We love seeing baptisms, but baptisms aren't the only good work out there for us to do. We need to be raising up new leaders. That's a great work. We need to be empowering young Christians and encouraging them to love and good deeds. We need to be making connections and introducing young campus disciples to campus shepherds, and all of those things are good things that we can do. And when you have a vision on hand, you're ready to take advantage of every small opportunity. And it makes me think of a story in Matthew 15. Turn to Matthew 15. And we'll read uh, verses 22 to 28. It says, leaving that place, Jesus withdrew to the region of Tyre. Oh, that's 21. Sorry. A Canaanite woman from the vicinity came to him crying out, Lord, say, son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter is demon possessed and suffering terribly. Jesus did not answer a word. So his disciples came to him and urged him, send her away for she keeps crying out after us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. The woman came and knelt before him. Lord, help me, she said. He replied, it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. Yes, it is, Lord, she said. Even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. Then Jesus said to her, woman, you have great faith. Your request is granted. And her daughter was healed at that moment. What got Jesus' attention in this interaction was the moment that she said that crumbs were enough. She got to the point where she knew that crumbs of Christ were good enough, that crumbs would be enough if they were from Jesus. You know, 2020 has felt crummy to say the least. 2020 has not been, it's not a Thanksgiving layout. It's not what we're used to. It's not, a, it's not even a cohesive slice of bread. Like crumbs are so accidental. <laughs> crumbs are so unintentional. Um, and that's what it feels like. It feels like everything is just like uncertain and unknown and we don't know where, what it's going. Everything feels like it's crazy. And if we're careful, if we're not careful, we can unintentionally give up on the fall semester before it even starts. We can decide it's just crumbs. It's just not what I'm used to. And God can't move in that. And I don't think that we should wait for there to be a Thanksgiving layout this fall for us to be faithful. We may not have our traditional two-week push. We may not have our cookouts and our game days and our freshman welcome week and, if, and helping people move in and like all the things that we're used to, the, the Thanksgiving layout spread. Um, it'll look different this semester for sure. It'll be social, social distancing sharing where you're like five feet, six feet. Hi, you know, like it'll be a little bit awkward. We'll be having virtual midweeks for some of us or wearing masks and FaceTime studies. And it's a good chance for us to question if our faith is in the method or if our faith is in the man. And Jesus is still here. Jesus is not canceled. Thank God <laughs> that Jesus is not canceled in 2020. We have to believe that crumbs of Christ are enough. That's going to have to be our faith. And, you know, I really do believe that God has shown us time and time again, and I know many of you in your ministries have experienced this, that people are still becoming disciples. You know, I think of two in this, in, in my own kind of sphere the last few months where uh, a sister named Catherine was baptized in March where we were studying and the quarantine started and we kept studying 100% virtual and she was baptized. And then another situation where a girl named Precious was baptized in June where we started studying after, you know, the quarantine started 100% online. And the first time I saw her that year, this year was baptizing her, you know, and I'm faithful that comments like when you're on, you know, you're on face to, FaceTime Bible studies or whatever it might be. And there's moments where it's like, oh, wait, you froze. I Wait, what did you say? I didn't catch that. The Wi-Fi dropped or my phone died or, hey, I can't FaceTime. I don't have an iPhone, you know, <laughs> like all these issues can, these crumbs can still lead to what is your good confession? 
we have to have faith that God can still work through this, that God can still move. And we have to be people of vision, even without the full spread. This woman was able to look at crumbs and say, even if you give me crumbs, Jesus, my daughter can still be healed. And so really having faith in those things, but it does require us to be intentional. It will require us to be ready. What I love about Nehemiah is like Jordan mentioned, he knew what he wanted. And that moment with the king, you know, that was kind of a crumb question. Like, why are you sad? He could have been like, it's been a hard day. I got some bad news. He could have been, you know, very general, like, but he took advantage of that. He, he welcomed the king into an opportunity to go do something about the situation. And so being, uh, having a vision helps us to be intentional. And Jordan's going to talk a little bit more about that. <laughs> Thanks, babe. Um, oh, it's so weird doing this virtually. But this, it, we're, we're used to it now, right? I got a bathing suit on. You don't even know. Okay, so back in Nehemiah chapter 2, we've talked about vision. Let's just briefly talk about intention. And um, you could actually do a study through Nehemiah where you see his vision equal intentionality through, through the whole book. Let's just look at two. He was intentional in casting vision. So not only was it burning on his heart in Nehemiah 1, in, in the earlier part of Nehemiah 2, but then he gathers the people. We don't know if he gathered everyone or just the leaders. But he says, then I said to them, you see the trouble we are in. Jerusalem lies in ruins and, the, and its gates have been burned with fire. Cody talked about that last night. Come, let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem, and we will no longer be in disgrace. I also told them about the gracious hand of my God. It was always about what God was doing through his life, uh, of my God on me and what the king had said to me. And they replied, let us start rebuilding. So they began began this good work. See, Nehemiah didn't just hope that when he got there that the people would follow him, but he intentionally like showed them what his plan was, cast the vision for them and called them to follow him. In Nehemiah 3, we, we see, you know, all the leaders from the different families step up on different parts of the wall. He cast the vision to call the leaders to join him. Another place, he was intentional in responding to conflict. You know, after the surrounding, after they had about half built the wall, you know, in the surrounding cities and kings heard about it, uh, you know, they made threats, they received opposition. And I'll just read the bold part. In my four. It says, from that day on, you know, they did their work with one hand and held a weapon in the other. And he tells the nobles and all this stuff, but he goes, wherever you hear the sound of the trumpet, join us there. Our God will fight for us. So they continued the work. When they received opposition, he didn't just hope that they wouldn't attack. He didn't just hope that it would all work out. Man, when it looked different than what he wanted to, and it wasn't going to be as easy as he he intentionally changed the plan where people are, I don't know how you work with one hand while you're holding this. I don't know what that looks like, but they figured it out intentionally uh, to respond to conflict. So how intentional are you? Do you have your vision? Do you have, what do you want me to do for you if Jesus asked you that in your ministry? And how intentional are you at carrying that out? How often do you go into autopilot mode where you just kind of go with what you know, but you aren't intentional about putting it in to practice? You know, what does vision without intention produce? Vision without intention produces disappointed leaders and doubting followers. Vision without intention produces disappointed leaders and doubting followers. You know, the, the first World Discipleship Summit eight years ago, can't wait for us to join all again in a couple years. Um, but I was single and, and I honestly going into that, I had this goal of I'm going to take a girl from every major continent on a date. And I didn't, I didn't complete it. I think I got four or five of them. But anyways, th- and so, but I got let on twice, all right? One day I went on and then the girl was cute. She was spiritual and she was mature. And then she told me she was 17 and I was 23. And I was like, oh no. And then it, and then it happened again. Yet again, the girl was spiritual. She was funny. She was mature. She was cute. And then she told me she was 17 and she wasn't a Christian. And I was like, wait, why did you say yes to going on a date? And it turned into a Seeking God Bible study. (laughs) But man, I got led on and I got disappointed. And for those of us that are naturally visionaries, we're naturally like just dreamers and faithful. And we're, we're constantly telling our leaders how they can grow and giving them vision and putting faith into them. But man, if all we ever do is cast vision and lift them up about what God can do, but they never see you intentionally put in the work to see it to fruition, then they're going to start to be disappointed. And they're going to start 
distrusting you, distrusting what you say. And if we're not careful in trying to cast vision and inspire faith, we can actually cause people to doubt. Because if it happens a consistent enough times, what you say God is going to do doesn't happen. And it doesn't just happen because God said wait or God said not yet, but it doesn't happen because you're not intentional about carrying it through. Then people are going to start doubting what you say. And they're going to start doubting what God can do. And so we need both. We need to have vision, high vision and high faith to believe even crumbs, the crumbs of Jesus are enough. But we also have to have intention to intentionally work towards the vision to see it through. Which one are you better at? Which one do you need to grow in? Whether we all need to become more balanced, but my encouragement to you is to find a right hand that can really balance you out. So what we're going to do now is we're actually going to go into a guided thinking. So here's where get out a piece of paper or your computer where you can type. Um, I'm actually going to be uh, kind of painting a picture for us and, and, and walking you through a set of questions about vision and intentionality to help you think through your ministry, specifically during COVID times. And I, I actually was a civil engineer at Georgia Tech. And so I'm going to nerd out a little bit with some of this and go down deep into a line of thinking. And while I don't think you have to do this with every single little piece, learning to do it mentally, if not on paper, to be intentional with your vision is going to be incredibly helpful. Um, We've done this before with people in person. We'll see how it goes virtually. So here we go. We got our piece of paper and all that kind of stuff. We're going to have some guided thinking. So first, start with your vision. When you're thinking about your ministry, what is your vision for your ministry three years from now? What, what's the big dream? What's the hairy, audacious goal, right? Like what's, what is the thing that if God, Jesus asked you, what is it that you want? What would you say? And I'm going to have a mock one at Nehemiah University. I don't know what to call it, Jesus University or Convert Me College or whatever. But at Nehemiah University, let's say my goal is to grow the ministry from 25 to 50 and to put five people in the ministry in the next three years. Like that might be an example, but I'm going to give you guys about 60 seconds to write it down. We're going to have a bunch of pauses for you to think. So you got 60 seconds. Okay, we're going to keep going. With all this, this is more to spark the thinking it's not going to be a complete line of thought right now, but I want to give you a model that we can sit down with God or with your leaders and work through. So first, what is your vision? At Nehemiah University, we're saying, man, we want to grow our ministry in the next three years from 25 to 50 and put five people into ministry. But the thing with that is, is I can't make that many people get baptized. I mean, in three years, basically your whole campus ministry graduates almost. So you basically would need to baptize 40 to 50 people for that to happen. I can't force people to get baptized and I can't force people to want to go into ministry. I, I don't, I can't control that. So let's break it down a little bit further to things that we actually have more control and influence over. So I, I want to call these ministry movers. So for you to get to your vision, for you to get to your dream, what needs to happen for you to get there? And Again, I want to make a special note, right? For all of us, there's one common thing, and it's, it's all that, right? It's Jesus, faith, the Holy Spirit, then faith, Jesus, faith, the Holy Spirit, faith, Jesus, faith, 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 right? Before anything and everything else, it's Jesus that's going to make these things happen. And we need to have that rooted in our hearts more than any, any kind of strategy. We believe it's our faith and Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit working through us, that's going to make these things come to fruition and make our dreams a reality. We need to have that deep in our hearts. But we also need to be intentional, and we need to take our, response, the leader, our leadership gifts with diligence and be responsible with them. So I want to say three criteria I think we should all think of to get, that we have influence and control over to get to where we want to go. So first is our leaders. And I don't care what your dream is and what God puts on your heart, man, he's going to want to work through your leaders to get there. Anytime he had a dream, God had a dream or wanted to change his people, he empowered a leader. It starts with your leaders. So what needs to happen with your leaders for you to get to your dream? And Toya is going to talk more about that. Um, I know for me in the last year or so, um, I've had to get really, really intentional um, about training leaders because I'm a mom. And so I, I'll, while these things can apply to anybody, I think especially for some of you sisters out there who are moms or even 
a newlywed wife. Like I think being able to empower our leaders is crucial. Like I, I cannot move them in. Like Nehemiah did not build the wall single-handedly. <laughs> like he had a team. And so empowering our leaders is something that's really important. So a couple of questions um, that you can write down and ask yourself, and some of these might apply to you, some of them may not. But is there someone who knows how to do what you do without you there? Meaning, can they, lead, can they lead a study without you? Can they have a conversation with a young Christian without you? Can they, you know, can they share their faith, set up studies? Like, and if not, how, how can you get there? Um, do girls have decision-making training and decision-making power when it comes to Bible studies? And what I mean by that is I've had to talk to my girls a lot about like, okay, one, how, how do, you, do you feel confident saying, hey, this girl is ready to move from discipleship to the next study, or this girl is ready to move from church study, like this girl's ready to get baptized, can someone come count the cost? Like, do they know what they're looking for? Are they trained in that to know it's more than just, oh, we went through all the scriptures, but what are they trained to find the heart of like, this girl is ready? And do they have decision-making power? Have you communicated to them, hey, I trust you. You can do this. Like, you come let me know when you're ready for, you know, the counting the cost study. Like, I really can't be in uh, every single study, I may be able to jump in towards the end, but my girls need to be confident that they know what they're looking for in training and they also have the decision-making power to make that decision. And then how far can they study confidently without me? That's a lot of training, a lot of my D groups, a lot of conversations of what, what, what study do you feel like you start to kind of waver in your understanding of what you're looking for. Having that conversation in D groups and doing a lot of training there. And what do you define as a successful semester? I think that's a good, good question for all of us is what do we define as, as success? What do we celebrate? When do we know that? How do we know when the wall is done? When do we know what to celebrate? And then finally, when it comes to my D groups specifically, I really try to figure out how are the D groups going with the people that they disciple. So even teaching girls and training girls of how to have conversations in their D groups that are teaching people to think like a leader, to teaching people to think with vision. And, and that takes a lot of intentionality. Um, it takes a lot of time, but hopefully some of these questions can really empower our leaders to feel like, hey, I can do this. And, and that's one of those good works that I believe God has called us to do as ministers is to help our, our leaders feel like, you don't need me. You can do this. Of course, get advice. Of course, walk together. But in the heat of the moment, they have to have that confidence and training to know that they have what it takes through, the, through Jesus' faith and the Holy Spirit, that magical combo. Okay, so that's our first ministry mover. Our second one and our third one, what we'll is go through? The second is culture. So what needs to change in your culture for you to get to your dream, to see your vision come true? And then your events, what do your events need to look like? Now, these, these are intentionally by priority, okay? A lot of times because our event is what people see the most and because it's most accessible, well, I think we can put a lot more focus on that and we can shift it up in priorities. That, that's not what's going to get to the dreams. When we look scripturally, God empowers leaders first, gives leaders conviction, trains leaders. Jesus trained the leaders to walk with him. And then the leader's conviction produces a culture in the ministry and then the culture of a ministry you can see and taste at an event, right? And so, but all three of those things do play a crucial role to move your ministry towards your dream. So we're going to have another 60 seconds here for you to reach your dream in three years from now. Where would your leaders need to be? What needs to change in your culture? And what do your events need to look like? Why don't you write a couple of these down with your dream? Okay, let's keep going. Um, so now that we got, okay, what is our dream? then what do we need to take to get there? Then we can go through it and we can work backwards. This is something that Tom Brown taught McGurk and Kendall and I when we first went in the ministry. And with our big dreams that we've had over the years, this is kind of how we, how we worked it through. So working backwards is if we have this dream from three years from now, then where would we need to be two years? Where would we need to be in a year? And you can work all the way back to where would we need to be at the end of the semester, right? And so when we think about these three ministry movers of leaders, culture, and events, where would you need to be at the end of the semester? And, and this is important to think through because there's this thing called a J curve, right? Where in a level of influence, it starts out not as strong and then it, and it shifts back up, right? And it's the idea of at the end of the semester, you might be focusing a lot more on your culture and your leaders, but you, you don't worry about your events yet because you know that's, that's what's most important. Or you know the baptisms will come after six months of building your culture, but 
let's, let's go to a semester. So Nehemiah University, right, where we got these gold for our ministry to go from 25 to 50 in three years and to put five people in the ministry. Maybe I say by the end of the semester with my leaders, I want to go from four to eight Bible talk leaders. I want to, and I want to empower my main guy and girl, right? You can think of Hamilton. I need my right hand man back, right? From George Washington <laughs> or in culture, we want to have a culture in our ministry, man, we need to have a culture of loving the lost. And we're going to have a goal in our culture for every disciple to be in at least one study. And then for events, maybe you say, you know what? Our events aren't on campus and they're not very powerful. So we want our Devo or our campus midweek to be on campus and we wanted to have a mix of strong preaching and, and having fun. Maybe that's an example, but let's go through our leaders, our culture, and our events. Where do you need to be at the end of the semester in order to work towards your goal for three years from now? I'll give you another minute or two to think about that. Now, what I've done in the past going from here is to talk through the flow of the semester, because I think it's really good for all of us to learn to say, hey, every semester kind of has a flow where you got the first two weeks you're meeting a lot of people and then the week or two after that it's all about getting filling your schedule up with studies you find a couple that are super consistent and then you know about four to seven weeks you're really in a lot of studies and you're gearing up for a big retreat and then afterwards you're really trying to convert them you could go through the flow of the semester with visitors and conversions you can go through the flow of semester of training leaders and discipling but with the covid semester i kind of want to go a different angle and um and with with all these things yeah, I do think at a certain point, it's good for you to write all this out. And, and it actually will help you to really think it through personally with God and with your leaders. But eventually, you, you want to get to a place where it just kind of happens mentally. And you, you, in any situation, like you've done it enough, you've thought through it enough, where you can just kind of think it through, like in the spirits really leading you in that moment. But I want to talk about COVID and how does this change during COVID? So here's where we're really going to all right, and let's go back to, let's act like we're in a non-COVID world, okay? So if we were in a non-COVID world, what steps would you take to get there by the end of the semester? So you have your three categories, like for, for in Nehemiah University, we were going to say, hey, we're going to go from four to eight leaders and empower main guy and girl leader by the end of the semester. What steps would I take to get there? Well, one step could be to have a weekly high faith training leaders meeting that we invite potential leaders to. Two, to cast a vision and walk with uh, our main guy and girl leader. For culture, we, we said, hey, by the end of the semester, we want to have a culture of loving the lost. Every disciple is one study. Well, what are two steps to get there? Maybe it's evangelism deed times where mm -hmm. you're in a, for every deed time that you're in, a piece of it's always sharing your faith and you teach your leaders to do that during their deed times to always share their faith for 20 minutes. And then you have a visitor focused retreat. First, I want us to start with a non-COVID semester before we switch to COVID. So let's take another 60 seconds with what you wrote down by the end of the semester where you want to get to. What's a couple steps or one step for each thing that you would usually do to get there? So I, I, we got a couple more questions, but I hope you can see, man, this is training. This is the campus training program. And while for a lot of us leaders, maybe we don't need to be trained on how to invite somebody to church anymore or how to run a leaders meeting, but we need to train our minds. We need to train our minds to have vision and to be intentional. And I hope you are taking these little breaks to really think it through, at least jot down a couple of things for each thing. But here's what we're really about to nerd out a little bit and switching to COVID, okay? So this is what I want you to do is during COVID, so coming back to COVID, look at what you wrote down. What did you write down as your steps to get to where you wanna be at the end of the semester? And what I want you to do is to circle or to bold what still has high impact? So which of those steps will still have high impact during COVID? And then I want you to cross out what loses most of its impact during COVID. So for instance, if I just talked about leaders and culture, um, where I say, you know what? I can still have a weekly high faith training meeting during COVID. I could still do that. I still think it'll have a great uh, impact. Actually, I think training leaders during COVID is one thing that actually that we can increase the impact of, um, which we'll be able to talk more about. But then with culture, um, where I want to teach my ministry to have a culture of loving the lost, I go, you know, I don't know about evangelism deed times because I don't know what that's going to look like on campus. It still might be great if there's people on my campus that I can share my faith with. It might not. I, maybe I don't know. But here's one. Visitor-focused retreat. During COVID times, we will not be able to go with 300 people to a retreat center. So that is going to lose its impact. And so look at the things you wrote down, circle or underline the ones that still have a high impact, cross out what loses most of impact. I'll give you about 30 seconds.
So I hope you can start to see, okay, what needs to change for me this semester? Or what do I need to think through? Let's go a step deeper. So now with that, take one step. You can do this with every step. Let's just take one for a limited time. Take one step that loses impact during COVID. Now, what are the things that usually accomplishes and can, what can you replace it with that would still have a high impact during COVID? So for instance, if we're going to our culture of loving the lost, usually we would have a visitor focused retreat. What would that usually accomplish without COVID? Well, visitors would focus on God for three days straight. That would really help them. It would inspire disciples to focus on the visitors and our leaders leading up to it to focus on visitors. And then at our visitor focus retreat, we would usually have a chariot ride or a conversion class where we can get them all in a room and talk about faith, repentance, and baptism. That would be the three things that it would accomplish. So take one of those steps that's not going to have the same impact during COVID. Write down three of those things that are two of those things that I'd usually accomplish. And then what could you replace it with? during COVID times that would still have a high impact. So maybe that idea of, you know, inspiring the disciples to focus on visitors. Well, how could I do that during COVID? Maybe in the middle of the semester, I have a Bible study campaign where instead of a first two week push where we're just sharing our faith for two weeks straight, maybe I get all of our leaders together and we're going to have a campaign to study the Bible with as many people as physically possible, or to study the Bible as many times as possible during two weeks with the people we usually study with. Because around a retreat, we'd usually study once or twice before a retreat, then at the retreat we'd study once or twice, and the next week we'd study once or twice. And that really helps the visitors and it helps the disciples. Can I have a campaign that does the same thing with my leaders, even if there's not a retreat? Or maybe the, the chariot ride. Maybe I say, you know what? How could I have a chariot ride a conversion class during COVID times? Why don't I split it up and inspire my leaders at the same time and have smaller Bible talk leaders or smaller groups of chariot rides where the Bible talk leaders lead a virtual conversion class with breakout classes afterwards. So what does that event that you can't do anymore, what does it usually accomplish? And then what could you do during COVID times that would still accomplish that same thing? I'll give you guys a couple minutes to think about that before we close out. Well, I hope this time was helpful for you guys as we talked about visioneering. And I would, I would really encourage you before the semester starts to take extended time to to man, push your mind, push your mind to first and foremost, to have vision and trust that the crumbs of Christ are enough, but then also push your mind to be intentional to how are you going to see that vision come to fruition in your ministry? But then the key is not just pushing our brains to do it now, because we can come up with the best plans and the best vision. But if we never cast the vision to our leaders, if we're not intentional through the semester and following through on the plans that the spirit leads us to, then man, it, it will fall apart. COVID is going to be different. This is gonna be the weirdest and most different semester we've ever gone through. Yet with vision and intentionality, I believe God will still do amazing things.